problem of uh, need experience to build a portfolio to get paid gigs. But to get experience, you have to write for places, and it's kind of looking for those jobs on Craigslist that say you want two years of experience for an entry level position. Which like, makes no sense. How does this work? A like catch 22, right? It's a catch 22 for experience, yeah. And um, what a lot of people do, and I, I've been kind of wrestling with this because I'm a big fan of paying people for creative work, is, yeah. Um, I'm the real hero. Is, Get a free blog and write on it. Because write also a lot. Then, yeah, write yeah. a lot. Yeah. Because then you have creative control. You're already paying for things that you know are in your control. You can pay for the hosting or buying like blogger or back in the day with live journal. Like there are ways to do this. Um, and kind of again, Facebook and social media go a long way in, in these sorts of connections. And just start talking to people. And on Twitter or Facebook. So a common piece of advice that you'll get is don't write for free. But I like that advice as a caveat, which is that at first you're probably going to be writing for free. Um, but the advantage to that is like the advantage that, that I have, which is like that I can write by whatever drives my interest for the most part. And if you're writing for, for yourself for free, uh, you know, then you can do that, right? You can write about whatever you think is the best. The, the thing is that when you get to the point where you're freelancing, you have to submit pitches, and I really want to segue into that and ask like, about that pitch process as well, but you have something to say. I would just be very happy to tell this is something that I've encountered. Um, if you write for yourself, because then it's just a discipline thing, it's a passion thing, but for the love of God, buy your domain name. Yeah. Nothing screams unprofessional than blank.com backslash username. When I started out, I got a blogger, and I bought the domain rights to study anime that very day. And it literally helped me land a bunch of early gigs, both in lecturing and in writing, because they saw studyanime.com. Is it a blogger? Yes, but it shows that you at least have the, uh, the wherewithal to own your domain, and you'd be surprised. It's kind of like, why do you need a college degree to get a job that doesn't require a college degree? Because the people hiring for it want to see that you took the wherewithal to do something. I discovered that um, I was told to my face by someone that because I owned my own domain name, they actually looked at it. As opposed to seeing blogger.com backslash whatever, or they actually, since you own your name, it actually will draw more, more interest in what you do because it shows that you're at least you're looking forward. It doesn't, be, it doesn't be your name, it can be whatever brand name you want to go by. I mean, I bought, what I blog on is secondtruth.com. I bought that like, years ago, like I've, I've had this domain name for a really long time. And it's great because it's really easy to find it because it gets SEO and it's really easy to find. So, so I know a programmer that early, even like the late 90s, um, when Star Trek DS9 was a thing, uh, he went by uh, his first name plus Dax. Really easy to find him now because he's had the same domain for so, for so long. And that was part of it was it kind of built up this identity over time that people could then find him and find him as. Now, to get to pitching. Yeah, let's talk about that because I'm curious how much time is spent pitching versus writing the article and how many pitches you have to send out before you get a little fight. <laughs> okay, I'm completely atypical here. Um, I have a 75% success rate. Um, that is I, really I have no idea. How I got a 75% success rate, but bear in mind that that means I made maybe in the last year I made 30 pitches, and most of them got accepted. Uh, again, atypical. There's a lot of luck involved. Uh, it was of the you you pitch like a maniac. I okay. Um, last year was the height of it. I was doing at least one pitch every other day to some place. Um, Probably paying someplace. Um, and the trick with that is, is that you have to kind of already have done research as to who pays and who doesn't. Um, again, when I introduce myself, um, if you are a magazine does not pay. The thing is with that is when you're talking about building experience, if you're pitching and you're a freelancer, you don't know how to work with other people necessarily. So what Haywire does is that they put you in touch with editors managing columns or something like that. And you get used to pitchy, you get used to deadline writing, you get used to, you know, the discipline of it and working with an editor constantly with you. And then if you just if you get to the point that, you know, hey I want to do this, I want to get paid, well, 
We are are too glad to say, by all means, here's where you can submit to and give you a list (laughs) of places that that pay. Uh, When you're pitching to places that pay, though, it's very, um, there's some tricks involved. One is, have an idea of what you want to write about, just don't go, I want to write about that here. That doesn't narrow it down at all. Um, when I pitched Unwinnable for their special issue last year, which was on Metal Gear, it's um, Metal Gear 5, just, Metal Gear Solid 5 had just come out. My roommate had been playing it constantly that week. And I remember looking in and going, huh, this is very interesting. Um, about what they do with the time, because you're never in the present day when the game takes place in the present day. Like, as a player, you're always in, moving around in time. Like, the player character is always in a different era than you are. So in Metal Gear Solid V, you're in this, like, you're in the late 80s, and so you're faced with the player knows what happened to, in Afghanistan after, like, 1989, of obviously we have some knowledge of this now, but the characters in the game don't. And I wanted to write about politics and time movement in the Metal Solid 5. And Unwinnable uh, basically went, you want to write about what? <laughs> I want to write about this. What do you mean by politics and time? Well, this is what I mean. Okay. Write exactly what you just said to me, and just make it longer. That was the essay. Um, in some cases, you'll be asked to provide an outline you pitch, and you'll be asked to at least provide three samples of your previous work. Again, have a portfolio. <laughs> you have to have experience to get experience. Yeah. 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 Um, that being said, what you can also do when you're pitching is. Um, this happened in my case as well as as well as Charles's case. Again, unminimal example. Unminimal just is, I, I guess I can say this now. Um, there was an issue that they're doing about Japan. Oh. Yeah. And well, we go to anime cons. We go to a lot of anime cons. I just got back from Japan a couple months ago. Um, you know, my my bachelor's degree was in East Asian studies with the Japanese. My, like. And so by the time they're like, yeah, we're looking for pitches, we're like, so, uh, how much experience do you want? Because in addition to these samples, we also have the education, we also have the experience. And if it's relevant, put that down your pitch. If you're writing about folklore and mythology and you're a minister, mention that. You know, um, <laughs> here that's relevant. It's written that I've discovered that's, that's kind of a weird thing. And I've noticed this, like, based on feedback that I got about pitches and so forth, is that people don't just want you to write about a video game. No, like, they want you to write about a video game plus this other thing you know. And that's a really common, like, and, and, and that's one of my questions, like, here, like, what's the most likely type of pitch to get looked at? And I feel like the most likely thing that I've seen, especially if you're writing, like, a critique, is it just, like, hey, can I review this game? Because Unless you develop like a report with that site, or you're already a staffer on that site, they, they pretty much take re- reviews or reviews. But they, that's like not as interesting as I have this weird area of expertise, and I can combine it with the game in some cool way. I mean, that the, the feedback you guys got? That's the feedback I've gotten. Um, one of my one of the articles that I pitched just went live, I think, last month was an article on um, the game Journey. Please go to the Journey Live Orchestra Live here, it's amazing. But the game Journey, when I was introduced to it, was literally, hey, this is a game about Buddhism, sit down and play it. That was everybody that mm-hmm. Sit down, play this game, it's Buddhism, the game. I go, okay, now I'm gonna write about Buddhism and Journey. Sounds like a great idea. And my editor was like, I would have never thought that by myself. Um, there's these connections that because people have different areas of knowledge, because you can't know everything about everything at every single time, um, so you kind of specialize naturally into things. One person might specialize in Japanese role playing games since 1990. Um, some person may specialize in ROM hacks, you know, that sort of thing. And you kind of learn that you bring in this 
whatever context and background you have to the games that you're playing. Uh, an architecture student might see, might see different things in level, level design than an English major, for example, right? Um, and so they'll encounter it different ways, and that's really what the, a lot of the critique sites will be interested in, are what can you bring that is interesting, and can you back that up? One of my old articles that I wrote in class from six years ago was um, a long piece about existentialism in Final Fantasy IX. And it was one of those things where the editor who had played Final Fantasy IX many, many times had never noticed anything existential in the piece until I explained to him uh, specific key scenes and how they reference futility. And he sat back and was just like, I want more of this. Please write more of this. And it's literally only because I had existentialism on the brain at the time that I was able to work with it and make it, make it work. And one, of the, one of my favorite memes is Business Cat of him saying, think outside the box, I have to move in it later. <laughs> and I discovered that thinking outside the box with anything is probably one of your greatest assets when pitching, it's one of your greatest assets. Like, my pitch, like what the Pokemon article, is incredibly long, and I spent a lot of time talking about why Pokemon is a landmark. I almost said, and bear in mind, all the people that were playing Pokemon, like that were eight years old in like 99, are adults now. And the general response was, yeah, I love Pokemon, do it. So <laughs> if you think outside the box, if you watch anything you do, you will have the opportunity to present things in an interesting way. If you present them in an interesting way, I mean, like, and then call back to another thing, uh, you, can, you can write about anything if you don't know want to phrase it. So you have to develop that broad base of knowledge, that broad base of, of, of style, just so you can pitch it properly or pitch it in a way that will get people to take a second look at it. 